Hello and welcome to Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Cory, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jap and Luke Cutford. Hello. Hi, howdy. This week we're talking about radioactive plants and gamma gardens. But first, Ooh. we have a little Apple review. Ooh, oh, we review. Oh, we we review. review. I do love these reviews. So this is a five-star review, of course. Head to Apple and uh, leave us a little a little podcast review, if you don't mind. This is a five-star review. It says, the best podcast. I absolutely love this podcast. I've only been listening for four months, and I'm hooked. I've already recommended it to my girlfriend. Keep it up, guys. You're all amazing, and Corey is so funny. Oh, oh that's nice. Jamp and I, yeah. not funny. Nah. Yeah, we're usually slated as the funny ones, aren't we? Yeah, wow. Yeah. You got everything. Yeah, you can just do hate us anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing here? I've been working on that. You know, like yeah. a little... <laughs> Sci guy. It's getting us out. Yes. <laughs> Singular. Yes. And as always, yeah, I'm yeah. joined by nobody. <laughs> <laughs> myself, me, myself, and I. So, my question as well for you listening, head to the YouTube comments to answer this question. What's your favorite fruit or vegetable? Mm. Ooh. I think mine's changed recently. So, I used to really I heard like. It changed recently. What is that? No, it's a, it's a new thing. No, I used to really like bananas, but I'm slowly like coming over to strawberries. Strawberries are like my new favorite, I think. My favorite is pineapple, but sometimes I eat too much and my mouth gets sore. I, I know that feeling. <laughs> Pineapple's very good. I think mango is the king of all fruits. Mm. Perfectly sweet. No? No. You, I mean, I maybe like you've not mango. had good mango, though. Like, good mango is. Oh, it's incredible. Pineapple is up there. Okay. It's very good. I like pineapple in salsa. It's very good. Oh, pineapple and chili is actually really nice. Really? Like chili, like um, pineapple with chilies and pineapple with salt. Ooh. Or I've had these sort of pickled pineapples with pickled jalapenos. Incredible. Like I could just drink that stuff. Very, very good. But we should probably get started on the episode. So yeah. we all know what the power of radiation was used for in the 30s and 40s. But in the 50s and 60s, there was a push for more positive uses for radiation. Ones that would benefit humanity. And from that came something incredibly interesting, but seemingly almost entirely forgotten. Have either of you heard of Atomic Gardens? No. no. That sounds like a band. <laughs> it does. Headlining Coachella. Oh, yeah, like Atomic a, European, <laughs> a European band. Yeah. yeah. That's Atomic Kitten. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, do you know? have any idea what an Atomic Garden might be? Is it an area of greenery that has been exposed to radiation? Is it a, like, is it a very intentional farming practice where you radiate some crops. Yeah, you're spot on. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. So cool. uh, Atomic Gardens or Gamma Ray Gardens or just Gamma Gardens, uh, it's a name, I love these names, is a name for a method of growing plants that started in the sort of 20th century and then was popularized in the mid to late 50s, which are still in the 20th century. I, kn I know that. Mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Being very nonspecific. <laughs> so uh, before we get into what Atomic Gardens are, I first want to cover what radiation is because that's very important to this mm. topic. And some people might not know all, all the different things about radiation. Mm. I know that you do. Luke, I know you know all about radiation. Every single thing. Every yeah. single thing. I'm a nuclear physicist. <laughs> so I don't know. So uh, radiation, as you know, Luke, yeah. is essentially just energy. And, yeah, that's um, right. Jamp, as Luke knows, energy. Yes, thank you. <laughs> moving as I'm glad with... when you know things for me. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. If it's, if it's radiation... I got it down. Oh, I think I'm on board. Yeah, I'm following. Yeah. If you're if you're confused, just look to Luke. He'll okay. I'm always confused. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's why you always look at me. Yeah. So, um, it's it's energy moving as waves or subatomic particles. Um, and there's radiation can mean some different things. We use it colloquially to mean a specific kind of radiation, but generally, radiation is just when energy. Uh, so, okay. You've probably learned about it in physics this way, right? You can transfer heat uh, in different ways. You can transfer heat by sort of convection or um, the sort of like, you know, the contact thing. Oh, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, conduction, that's it. That's it. Um, and you can also uh, transmit it by radiation. Now, that would be basically what the sun, how the sun gets its heat to us. It sends, mm. it sends, uh, the sun is shooting out <laughs> basically ele electromagnetic waves in all directions all the time. And those hit Earth and heat up the atmosphere and the ground and all of those different things, right? So radiation is essentially just energy moving in the form of waves or subatomic particles. Now, there are broadly two different types of radiation. Do you know what those are? Uh, two. I mean, well, 
radiation that's emitted via a particle and radiation that's emitted via a wave. So, n- not quite. So, I'm told, I'm looking for non-ionizing and ionizing radiation. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So, the, the, generally, when, you, when you're talking about radiation, um, those will be the two kinds right. of... Um, those will be the two categories. And this is difficult because, as I've said, we colloquially use radiation to mean... Lots generally just the ionizing the radiation ionizing, right yeah. so if i say radiation to a to you know to the layman yeah um if i say hey jamp radiation jamp would yeah. be thinking oh the demon core chernobyl <laughs> scary and bad yeah scary and bad yeah. whereas scary right bad. now we are using radiation um t- to light to this time. room exactly yeah. to see each other Exactly. That's nice. Oh, 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 oh. Ooh, no, scary and dangerous. Radiation. That is scary and dangerous radiation. <laughs> oh, but I mean, okay. Corey's so, looking at me. <laughs> I'm looking at both of you. Uh, oh. So, and yeah, so obviously this is going to be difficult talking about radiation, but I'll try and be specific about what kinds of radiation I'm talking about. If you're confused or if I'm just saying radiation on its own, just assume that if I say radiation, I'm talking about all forms of radiation mm. um, and we'll mostly be talking about ionizing radiation. Today. The bad one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah generally. Yeah. So we'll just quickly go through non-ionizing radiation. It's got less energy. Can't really remove electrons from atoms. That's why it's called uh, non-ionizing. Because an ion is just an atom that has lost uh, an electron or gained an electron so that its charge is not the sort of neutral zero essentially right yes yeah as i know you, you know this look of course yeah, so i'm looking at you you know this you know this completely i don't even need to do you can do this episode <sighs> tell me something Go i on. don't know man <laughs> <laughs> so uh you know uh, obviously uh we're talking about uh, non-ionizing radiation it cannot turn atoms into ions it can't remove electrons from atoms and molecules and it can't or... turn frogs gay well uh, well hmm. light can't turn i think we can pretty much go out on a limb and say light can't turn frogs gay i feel like you use a light very very um non-ion non-ionizing radiation can't turn frogs gay unless straight frog sees or like mm, by curious frog sees via the non-ionizing radiation bouncing off of a very sexy frog um a sexy frog and then turns the the frog turns gay i I think it's probably yeah i think it's probably how all yeah frogs turn gay Uh, no some of them are born um, gay well, I don't believe in that. No, no, no. no. I was thinking this is. I think it's, it's the water. What's clearly obvious? Nurture only. <laughs> what's clearly obvious is all of those gay kids shows now. You know, as soon as you put a yeah. gay kiss in a kids show, which is shown on TV using radiation, non-ionizing, non-ionizing Generally. radiation. Mm. Um, yeah, a TV, a TV that just shot out gamma rays. Just well, it's, <laughs> it's TV broadcast with ionizing. No, it's, it's non-ionizing. Non-ionizing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we, so. yeah. yeah, we generally don't use ionizing radiation um, <laughs> unless we can, you know, protect people from it. Like, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah. So um, yeah. So we don't use ionizing radiation if we can if mm. we can avoid it. Um, Non-ionizing radiation, as I said, less energy, can't remove electrons from atoms, um, um, it can't remove electrons basically from whatever, or molecules, uh, so it's generally less dangerous, right? Uh, but you can still be damaged by um, non-ionizing radiation. Some types of non-ionizing radiation are uh, ultraviolet light, visible light, infrared radiation, mm. microwaves, and radio waves. I remember the order of everything on that spectrum because of gay X-Men use vibrators in my rectum. Oh, yes, you've told me this. So... Non-ionizing radiation can turn you gay. Jesus. If the gay <laughs> X-Men are using vibrators in your rectum. But the gay X-Men are the ionizing radiation. They're the ones that are turning me oh, gay. Oh, okay. So it's it's exclusively ionizing radiation that turns you gay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the gay okay. X-Men. Only. Okay, yeah. cool. The gay X-Men. Good. Yeah. Like, you know, Iceman and Shatterstar is not an X-Man. Is Iceman gay? Yeah. It I came out know. a little while ago. I don't know much about the X-Men. What? Really? Yeah, Iceman's gay. Oh, fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice, oh, isn't that's, it? That's um, nice. So, <laughs> so uh, th- mostly what they'll do is just heat things up. You know, um, you know, visible light can heat things up. That light is probably getting kind of toasty. Ever mm, worn any yeah. black plimsolls outside on a sunny day? Oh boy, you toasty ever, feet. You ever, you ever walked outside on a holiday with no shoes on the on some bare uh, oh. bare tarmac? Oh, oh. oh. spiky like and that. warm. Yeah. <laughs> so true. <laughs> um, so yeah, that will heat stuff up, and that's why you know UV light gives you sunburn. So I'm not saying it's not damaging at all. Um, it it can be damaging, but you know you can sit out in the sun for a good bit um, and probably be generally fine. Mm. Oh, not me. You, you don't want to sit next to something that's emitting gamma radiation for very long because your no. your skin might fall off. Maybe and other things mm. too. You know, mm. organ failure, death, all of that. But your skin will probably yeah. just. 
It's off. one of those reasons is enough for me to yeah, one of them. avoid it. Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah. To be fair, my skin does that with non-ionizing radiation as well. I mean, technically, everyone's skin is falling <laughs> off, but I mean, more than you'd want, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you can get burns and whatnot, you know, from non-ionizing radiation. I'm not saying it's completely harmless, but it's safe enough for us to use pretty much constantly. You know, we've got yeah. radio waves transmitting stuff. We've got light, visible light, you know, going everywhere. We're using infrared on our uh, TV remotes. We've got UV sort of black lights and, and whatnot. Mm. All of that sort of stuff. We're using it willy-nilly. You give it to a little baby, right? Yeah. You give it to a kid. You don't worry. Yeah, you would give not give... iPad. <laughs> iPad babies. Yeah, iPad babies, yeah. exactly. You would not give... Now, if, if iPads emitted gamma or x-rays um, <laughs> oh. to a significant degree... Yeah, probably wouldn't be wanting oh. to give that to a baby, we right? We wouldn't have many babies um, left. No, oh, gosh. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so, you know, the non-ionizing is not what we're interested in. We're interested in the ionizing radiation. And usually that's what people mean when they talk about radiation, as we've said. Um, those are usually produced um, uh, from radioactive decay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you know what radioactive decay is, Luke? It is when a... Um, so true. So yeah. most atoms on Earth are stable. <laughs> this is from the International the Atomic Energy Agency. You already know. You don't need to prove yourself. That's true. Yeah, I was looking at you the whole time. So this is a quote from the International Atomic Energy um, Agency, probably li written by Luke himself. Um, it says, most atoms on Earth are stable, mainly thanks to an equilibrated... Uh, equilibrated? Whatever equilibrium uh, and stable composition of particles neutrons and protons and th in their center um, or nucleus however some types of unstable atoms the composition of the number of protons and neutrons in their nucleus does not allow them to hold all, uh, hold those particles together such unstable atoms are called radioactive atoms when radioactive atoms decay they release energy in the form of ionizing radiation for example alpha particles beta particles um, gamma rays or neutrons which when safely harnessed and used can produce various benefits Luke do you want to translate that into uh, plain English not really no <laughs> essentially what they're saying is that most atoms are stable yeah. um, you've got a nucleus with protons and neutrons you know protons being the positively charged ones the neutrons being the ones with no charge um, and they're, they're just sitting there at the nucleus and they're they're hanging out together and they're all happy and fine mm. other uh, other sort of atoms um, are, are, are just the worst they are unstable they're all over the place, and they're they're firing out their they're firing out their alpha particles. They're firing out their beta beta particles. They're firing yeah. out all kinds of ionizing radiation. They're having a moment. Exactly. They're yeah. having they're having a moment. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so that's the sort of difference. Some atoms are stable are stable, and other atoms are unstable, and they want to reach a point of stability. Essentially. Don't we all? <laughs> what I hope so, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that's where that's where radio, uh, radiation comes from. But interestingly, obviously, we think of ourselves as being non-radioactive, and you know, generally speaking, we're we're not that radioactive. But we're a little bit radioactive. Mm -hmm. Everything is a little, everything a little, a little bit radioactive. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're you're generally fine with that. You know, it's not it's not super harmful. You know, that's and radio radio uh, radiation is actually how um, radioactive part uh, sort of. Um, atoms is how we use uh, carbon dating, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you want to do a brief explanation of that, Luke? So, um, when you have a thing, uh, the carbon in it, o over time, decays um, mm -hmm. from carbon... Which is it? Which one is it? Carbon-14. Carbon-14. Okay, yeah. And basically, you can measure the amount of radiation coming off of something um, and that, by knowing the half-life of carbon, um, you can date how long it was since it was made. Yeah, essentially, yeah. Oh. Because it decays over time, and so you can measure that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so as I said, everything is a little bit radioactive, but that's not really usually what we're talking about when we're talking about sort of actual radiation. We're talking about, you know, these particles that are quite radioactive and quite dangerous. So the different types of ionizing radiation, I've kind of already touched on them, but we've got alpha radiation, which can be stopped by paper. Um, they're heavy, positively charged particles, essentially just a helium ion um, with a positive charge. So... Mm. It's just helium without the electrons, so that would be two protons and two neutrons. So it's kind of it's you know it's heavy. It's about the weight of helium, mm. um, <laughs> more or less. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, more or less. But like, yeah, missing the electron, uh, <laughs> and that's just sort of fired out. Um, and they're heavy; they don't travel very far. So you know, they they just kind of and they also can't penetrate very well, which is why you're probably pretty good with just your skin. Your skin's a great defense against alpha particles. Mm. Um, unless you ingest it. Oh. Very bad because it can't get out. 
yeah, that's don't in, don't <laughs> don't ingest alpha particles. So if I you want to know where out, you'd find alpha particles. So americium two forty one, which americium is just a chemical element uh, that emits uh, alpha particles, and we use that in smoke alarms, smoke detectors. So yes. do not eat the americium in your smoke detector. Oh, but it's so tasty. No, it's not. It's so yummy. It is, it's it's make you sick. You ever look at a smoke detector and you're like, mm, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, there's one up there. I'm, I'm <laughs> oh man, I'm hungry. Oh. Yeah, so I mean, there's radioactive. We use like sort of radioactive. We think of radiation as being this dangerous thing that we should never. Uh, no, we use uh, we use ionizing radiation. Mm. Um, you know, in 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 homes to keep us safe. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, as I said, you know, it, your skin is a great barrier to that because it can't really penetrate it unless you introduce it to the interior of the body. In which case, it's going to wreak havoc because it's just this heavy thing that is ru- basically it's a bull in a china Bouncing shop. Bouncing around. A tiny little bull in a very very large china shop, but it's very good at knocking over that china. It's so yeah. funny because it's literally so harmless outside the body and yeah. literally so horrible inside the body. <laughs> you could stop it with like paper. Paper, yeah. yeah. Paper. It, it can't. It cannot travel through sort of paper. So it, <laughs> and yet. And yeah, like and imagine yet. an ant. Yeah. An ant can't get through paper. But then imagine you <laughs> ingest an ant and it rips all of your atoms and molecules apart. I feel like yeah. ants would fully yeah. do that if they weren't digested. Though. True. Yeah. Yeah. Alpha radiation. Especially a bullet ant. Mm. Right? You're so right. Mm. You're so That's right. That's a callback to last week. <laughs> Beta radiation is the next one. Um, that can be stopped by just aluminium, um, which is it's slightly more penetrating than alpha uh, radiation. It's just an electron emitted from a particle, essentially. Um some can penetrate skin and cause burns, uh, but generally it's still most dangerous when you ingest it. Um, so, you know, careful about beta radiation, but um, it's it's not the most harmful thing unless you're eating it. Which, again, I would recommend please don't eat. Please don't eat. <laughs> Easy to avoid, then. Don't Just eat radioactive don't eat yeah, materials yeah. that are, that, that, that are yeah. emitting that kind of radiation. It's not good for you. It's just not. An alpha a day keeps the doctor away? No. An alpha a day... <laughs> Sorry. Keeps the doctor in your Sends home. the doctor your way. Yeah, <laughs> says the, oh, that's a good one, yeah. An alpha at all sends the doctor your way. <laughs> Not even a day. <laughs> yeah, well, look, you've probably only got a couple days. That's, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the penultimate one is gamma radiation, which you probably know most about. That's the Hulk radiation. You know, it's the one that gave the Hulk his powers. Yeah, the real life um, Hulk. Yeah, the real life Hulk. Yeah, yeah. Hulk Hogan. That's why yeah. he's like that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that's high energy electromagnetic radiation. It's literally the exact same thing as light. But faster. But faster. Oh. Well, no, no, not faster. Thinner. It travels at the same speed, yeah. obviously. The like, yeah. okay. speed of light is the limit. Um, but what it does is it's got a, it, it's got a higher frequency, yeah. a shorter wavelength. So it's um, where, you know, um, a sort of... Uh, Visible light, let's say, would have much wider sort of. It'd be like sort of um, a very, very uh, not steep hill. Yeah. You know, like like barely a uh, barely an incline. Whereas gamma radiation would be like th- essentially like like a straight line up almost. Mm. You know, like or a very very tall pointy mountain. That's that's what we're kind of working a with. Cliff here. face. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And then another cliff face the other way. Yeah. So this is this is the so the it's the, the point here to understand is that it's not moving necessarily faster than visible light, but it has a higher frequency. It's got a shorter wavelength. It's just it carries more energy. And having more energy means that like, you know, it can do more damage, essentially. Um, you know, uh it can pass through your body, uh-huh. it can when it passes through your body, it can just ionize and tear stuff up in your body. Like this this is the kind of radiation we talk about when we're talking about radiation sickness yeah. usually and that sort of thing. Like um they'll just it'll just wreck you. Yeah. Just horrifically like wreck you. You know what I mean? Radiation sickness is not something you want to deal with. I mean obviously, you know, if you've got low level radiation sickness, you can recover. It's it's fine. It's unpleasant, but you can recover. That sort of high level like being exposed to like a massive gamma burst Oh my god, that is... Uh, you would want someone to just sort of shoot you in the head. Like, yeah, it's, just like, fall apart. Yeah, honestly, though. We, yeah. we, so if you go back to, I think, our third episode, was it? Or not the Six. third episode, sixth episode, The Demon Core. Yeah. Um, that one, we, we go into sort of everything that would happen to you um, yeah. in, in, in that situation. Because it actually happened to some people. So, you know, you don't want to be exposed to gamma, gamma rays. Um, they can sometimes be relatively harmless apparently um but then obviously 
when they pass through the body and they're absorbed, they can cause damage. Um, you can stop them with, do you know what you can stop uh, gamma rays with? Lead. Lead or concrete, mm. but a thick layer. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're not like, you can stop or dampen them, obviously, you know, because um, they'll lose some energy going through there. But yeah, no, like that is, it is, this is the rain, this is the scary radiation. I mean, it's, yeah. we still use it, obviously. We use it um, in healthcare and whatnot. They think this is generally what they, what they do with chemotherapy. They basically just fire gamma rays at something um, to, to kill Rip it. it up yeah because it's very good at destroying stuff so we use it to destroy the stuff that we want to destroy yeah um, like missiles missiles generally not very good for you <laughs> but we do use them sometimes because they're very good at destroying things dear me yeah oh, no. and so uh <laughs> there's also x-rays as well which are ionizing as well but less energy than um gamma rays and so you can uh, we use them because x-rays will pass through you mm. right but they're um they're uh they'll lose energy passing through some of the the, the sturdier parts of you like bones mm. that's why we use x-rays for x-ray imaging it's just mm. oh i love that stuff because it's just like this 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 light can just pass through you yeah it just shoots right through your body and we're using that yeah. in like a very sort of um, interesting way. It's almost and like a photocopier for your insides. <laughs> it is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Just different wavelengths. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it functions. People think of x rays as this sort of technology, but it, it, it's. X-rays are literally just cameras, mm. essentially. You know what I mean? It's the same sort of principle. Cameras with a flash. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. the same sort of um, uh, flash film sort of camera sort of thing. Like, in that you've got film, um, which just sort of it changes based on the, the light that hits it. Mm. X-rays are more or less the same. It's just yeah. they can't get through. It can't get through your bones as yeah. easily. Love that. So simple. Right? It's, yeah, it's so simple. It's Smile. fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but then that's what there's obviously a limit on x rays because they can be harmful to you. That's why you can't just, you know, go for an x ray whenever you want and have as many as you want all the time because they there is the chance of them causing that bit of harm. Right. Is that why the doctor runs away? Yeah, it's where the dentist yeah. goes around the corner. Yeah. And that's why because the doctor's always like, oh, don't worry, this isn't harmful. And then they bolt <laughs> in the opposite direction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just like, the big door. Oh, yeah, they doing like around. 50 a day of those, yeah. aren't they? <laughs> but this is why um, the, the sort of, the thick layers of lead or concrete, that's why if you've got like a radiation sort of, uh, radiation part of the hospital or whatever, it's just thick. Mm. Like, it, you know, it's, it's, it's thick walls, thick yeah. concrete, all of that stuff. It is built to... Um, it is built to stop the harm going, like, you know, coming to anyone else. Yeah. Because that they just pass through stuff. Uh, there's also neutrons, uh, sort of, um, which are um, sort of, you know what neutrons are, right? They're the, mm -hmm. I've already explained that. They're the sort of parts of atoms that are, they've got no charge, they've got mass. Mm -hmm. um, they're relatively massive, you know, compared to other subatomic particles. Um, and as I've said, they, one of the primary parts of, of the sort of nucleus. Yeah. Um, they don't directly ionize though because they they're not charged but essentially the way that they interact with other atoms can create ionizing radiation so mm. it, it's not like ah oh, this isn't ionizing me it, no it will it will mess you up like you you don't want to mess with that with that sort of neutron radiation either um they are very penetrating you can stop them with a, th a thick mass of concrete mm. um uh or water or paraffin, you got you got you got to stop them with like a lot of stuff, you know. But um, yeah, no, you you, you don't want to deal with that either, <laughs> like, because no. it can, because this is this is the one that will make other kinds of radiation. It's oh gosh, yeah, you don't want to mess with that. It makes a chain reaction. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Oh dear, um, yeah, not good. <laughs> and so we now understand what radiation is. I want to talk a little bit about mutation because we know that radiation can cause mutations, right? Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. And where I love how this, I love how this is all sort of constructed. It's such a smart idea the way that um they've, they've sort of come to this. So mutations are essentially just changes to your genetic code, right? Every single time your DNA replicates, uh, there's a chance that there's going to be sort of a mistake or um you sort of mm. miscoding essentially a mutation. Um, and obviously your cells have safeguards against this. Uh, you know, you've got things to protect your DNA or to repair your DNA. Um, uh, but obviously it doesn't always always work however mutations are really important like we need mutations why yeah. why do you think it's how we evolve exactly ah, there wouldn't be diversity or species or, or any yeah. of that without mutations mutations are essential to sort of life as we know it today i mean if you think about it if there were no mutations um okay so for one thing yeah you wouldn't be getting new sort of viruses and bacteria and whatnot um but you, if, if something, if something was, if something existed that was there to sort of, that could hurt, that could hurt or kill you, you've got no way to necessarily sort of adapt to that, right? Because 
you can't evolve in any meaningful way because your DNA is consistent and constant. Mm -hmm. So a mutation could be something as simple as a single base pair of DNA changing. So the smallest mm -hmm. sort of unit of code that you can get in DNA just being sort of swapped out for something else. Yeah. Um, and that one single change can have can have big implications down the line because the DNA obviously codes um, for your proteins, right? And if you know you change one point in the DNA, then that could change um, one of the sort of building blocks of the protein, which could then change its structure, and that could then change its function, which could then change, you know, how your body is working. You know, like it, it's it's honestly it's insane how much sort of one small change can make. Mm. Not all mutations are just one small change. In fact, like, you know, with a lot of mutations that sort of, um, sort of uh, cancer and whatnot, you need to have a few mutations um, usually to actually cause serious troubles because your body is like, your body's set up to avoid these mutations becoming an issue, right? Mm. Because mutations are built into the very fabric of life, of evolution. But then again, as I've said, uh, single point mutations, just the one tiniest bit of the change of a gene, aren't necessarily always that disruptive. Um, and... There are different things that can cause mutations. I've already said that when your DNA replicates, there could be errors in that replication, but there could also be sort of external factors that cause mutations, like chemical mutagens or ionizing radiation. Mm -hmm. And the reason that, that would be is that it, it just kind of messes up your DNA a bit, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. It's just, it's just tear, as I said, it's tearing stuff up in your body. It's tearing through the DNA. It's like, boop, you're yeah. not the same anymore. <laughs> you're different. Like that switch? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I don't like this. Gone. Mm, boink. <laughs> so the sun is the sun is participating in evolution then, which is very interesting. Yeah, I mean the sun is um the the light from the sun is essential to almost all life on Earth. Almost, yeah, definitely almost all life mm. on Earth. Gosh, there's some like because there's some things down at the bottom of the ocean that are getting uh, stuff from hydrothermal vents and whatnot. Yeah, but it's really tough because like whenever you um whenever you try to remove the sun from the equation you almost always come back to the sun. Like, yeah. it's really annoying. So it's like a knock-on effect that exactly. gets back to the sun, yeah. Like, you could say, oh, well, fungi... <laughs> well, yeah, but fungi are eating living stuff, and what's the living stuff eating? Well, it's eating plants. Well, what's the planet eating? The plants eating sun. Yeah, exactly. Plants eating sun. <laughs> it's always sun. Is there, any, there, is there any ionizing radiation that gets through um, the atmosphere from, from the sun? So, according to the internet, uh, higher-end UV rays mm. can also be ionizing. So, this is... Yeah. Mm. So, that, I mean... I would assume that's where sort of the idea of sort of skin cancer mm, right. that comes from. From obviously, we know it comes from UV mm, rays from the sun. Yeah, would be ionizing and then causing issues with your with your with your cells, and they don't know when to die. Mm. And do you know? I mean, this is a very specific question that you may not know the answer to. But do you know if there's any any mechanism by which I suppose there would be, especially in smaller smaller celled organisms, um, ionizing radiation from the sun could interrupt the DNA and could cause a mutation that could potentially become a new species or become a new branch of that evolutionary chain? Mm, I don't know. I feel like the more likely causes for... So when you when you get smaller and smaller species, they're replicating, they're, they're reproducing yes. way more often, yeah. right? Uh -huh. You know, like bacteria. Like you could you could create new strains of bacteria you know, on a weekend or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I feel like... I, I, I feel like, you know, it, it, the ionizing radiation... And ionizing radiation is maybe less it's it's almost i i will say almost definitely um less responsible for these sort of mutations in new species than is you know just the sheer speed of that replication because you know, think about us right generations for us are god i mean you know gen z gen uh, gen, uh sort of gen x um millennials all of that that's about 20 years mm, about 20 year ish, gap yeah. 20 20 odd years a generation for a rat is a few, few weeks. Few weeks. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just trying to think, okay, how long they're pregnant for, then they've got to reach sexual maturity. They only live two years. A few weeks yeah. is a generation wow. for a rat. So that you gotta think of that condensed time period. Like how much sort of how many mistakes can be made there, all of that all of that sort of stuff um yeah. carrying on through. Really that that is more to play than I think necessarily um ionizing radiation. And we'll get on to actually why um that doesn't work in just a second um in fact we'll get onto it right now because i've got it right in front of me cool um so th there are different kinds of mutations um obviously but i mean what i'm drawing a distinction between here is the different kinds of mutations in in terms of what kinds of cells um are mutated so we've got uh 
we could broadly split ourselves into two categories, right? Right. These are not the only two categories, but if you want to look at a specific, uh, look at your body in a specific way, you could split them into two categories. You've got somatic cells and germline cells. Right. Your somatic cells are just your body cells that are just for you. They're doing their own thing. You got your, you know, I was gonna say your teeth cells. You do have your teeth cells. You've mm. got your um from from the like the bloody pulp, by the way. If anyone's gonna tell me that it's actually from the from the living part yeah. in your teeth. Okay. Yeah. Um sorry. <laughs> um you've got, you know, you've got your um you've got your blood cells, all the, all of these different types of cells, right? Um now you've also got germline cells. Do you know what those are? Is that like from the gut? Where there's no. lots of like bacteria in your body. That is that is a very good guess. That okay. is a very very good guess. But it's um, actually the sort of gametes, the reproductive cells. Mm. So it's the gametes, right. and then the I think I think also what well, included in that would be the cells that then produce the gametes. So if you make mutations to your body cells, that's not going to affect your offspring because mm. you because you know it's not like when you want to produce um, sperm or eggs. Um, that you you just pick different bits from all your body. You've got specific cells that mm. make those um, sort of that make those gametes. And so, d- disrupting the sort of okay, put it this way: if you get cancer, for example, from uh, I don't know being in the sun beds too much, right, mm. or smoking, you're not then passing the cancer down to your kids. No, do you know what I mean? No. You're yeah. you're not doing that um, because you're not because you're, because th- those mutations aren't affecting your germline cells. So that's the that's the distinction there. Sorry, that's like, the I big have... thing in, um, when we're talking about CRISPR-Cas9 as well, isn't it, about gene editing is about, uh, as it's sort of more morally and ethically sound as long as it's not ever getting to the germline cells because you're not passing down the... If you change something about the gene, like you change the eye colour or something, as long as it doesn't go da- down to the next generation, it's not really a risk other than to that one organism. Yeah, to, <clears throat> to some extent it is, uh, it's then contained, yeah. right? Yeah, and you're, you're spot on. So, and it, it's important to, to, to understand the, the, the difference between these two things here because Luke is almost like exactly pointed out, like you make a change to one organism, unless you're changing the germline cells, you're not making a change to future organisms. Mm-hmm. So that's just a really important thing to bear in mind. And so that, by the way, Luke, I don't know why I didn't think about that immediately, but that is why, um, at least one reason why um, that sort of ionizing, uh, any ionizing yeah. radiation is then... Because it happens to the surface level cells. Yeah, yeah. your skin cells, yeah. all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's not... Yeah. Unless um, you just put your balls out in the sun. Mm. Lay them out. Oh, you get yourself some alpha cells. My, Luke, your scrotum doesn't make sperm. Oh. Yeah. Damn it. Yeah, I'm sorry, Why buddy. have I had my balls out in the sun for so long? I was hoping to make a new super race. It's <laughs> the second weird thing I said in the recent podcast. The first one was, you guys have got Mr. Tattooed along your penis, right? From birth? That was a fantastic clip. Oh and then God, uh, the second one is, oh, why have I had my balls out in the sun? <laughs> <laughs> Just get some tan on them, you know, a bit of colour. I can't tan. No. <laughs> well, red is a colour. <laughs> so just to recap there are a bunch of different things that can cause mutations you know you've got viruses chemical mutagens radiation um and if they don't if they change just your body cells and not the cells that make you know your gametes your um sort of sex cells baby mm. cells yeah your baby making cells, ba- cells um like then it's it's not going to affect your offspring you know it's probably not going to affect your offspring because yeah. your offspring come from your gametes mm. So we've spoken about radiation. We've spoken about like what sort of causes mutations. We understand all of that sort of stuff. Now, I think would be a good time to talk about how atomic gardens actually work, mm. right? So, I mean, I said you understand all this stuff, but how, why would it be useful in producing crops? Do you have any guesses? To in- make them genetically different so you can make them bigger, maybe? Or more yeah, spot taste- on. tasty? Cool. Yeah, exactly. Spot yeah. on entirely. Okay, cool. Wait, so so are, you, are you just exposing them to radiation to up the number of mutations and then you see which yeah. ones are good. Yeah. So right. uh, atomic gardening uh, basically just uses radiation to cause mutations in plants. And it's, it's just, it's, as you've said, it essentially speeds up the mutations, uh, speeding up the the, um, the sort of uh, selective breeding process mm. um, because it, it, it creates, it's creating more mutant traits. Yeah. And by that logic, it's then also creating more chance for a positive mutant trait um, that it, that confers some kind of benefit to the plant. 
this is a great or, example of something that sounds very scary in theory. Yes. But is actually fine. Oh, it's actually yeah. fine. Yeah, no, it's awesome. It's so cool. Because <laughs> I was look, I was really into this. And I'm like, why are they doing this? This is, but then, it makes so much sense. And yeah. I love it so much because you could see it as a direct sort of ancestor to um, uh, GMOs. And like, like, it's it's so interesting to have this nice little middle step that no one ever talks about. Like, I was never taught about this. And mm. this is so, so cool. So... They speed up the process of selective breeding uh, by creating more mutant traits that may provide some benefit, not to the plant, bear in mind, to us. Because mm-hmm. that's what we do when we're selectively breeding. We just want we just want it to be like good and tasty for us yeah. and yeah. and produce nice. lots and lots of fruit and or lots and lots of like edible parts very yeah. quickly and be resistant to disease and just stop being a plant plant, start being human food. That's all we want. <laughs> uh, so Wasting all your energy on these stupid leaves. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Unless I want to eat the leaves, in which case. They which could be very nice Keep them leaves. Yeah. 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 Less and flowers <laughs> if you're a spinach. <laughs> <laughs> So the New York Times actually interviewed Dr. Pierre Lagoda in 2007. He is the head of plant breeding and genetics at the International Atomic Energy Agency. I checked his LinkedIn. He's been, he's doing it still, apparently. Oh, wow. yeah. Consistency from Pierre. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll just quickly tell you what the role of the IAEA is. Luke, you surely know this. Um, Me and the IAEA, we go well back. <laughs> <laughs> well acquainted. <laughs> but please, I'll humor you. <laughs> So um, essentially what they do is they just they just help all of the people that are a part of them, all, all of their member states um, with nuclear technology. Mm. Um, key point is that it's positive stuff. It's good things, you know, for health. And I'm just reading this from their website here for health, agriculture, environmental protection, water management, energy, industry. I really hope the environmental protection is like just firing gamma rays at poachers and the stuff, you know? <laughs> Like, I got a gamma gun here. You stay away from this lake. (laughs) The invisible laser beams. (laughs) I mean, most, I think most laser beams would be invisible. Yeah. Well, unless they were also fired with a nice little helpful, like, guiding light, yeah. guiding yeah, like light a, shot. A guiding yeah. Light. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just so you can see where it goes. But no, you would do that, though, so that people know. Because otherwise, yeah. there's no Oh, are they, fi- are they firing? Are they not? I don't oh, know. What's going on? Well, maybe that would work extra well. I feel, if ooh. they're just pointing a gun at you, you're like, am I being shot? I don't know. <laughs> but would, in, in practice, in um, air, when you're not in a vacuum, I think gamma and light rays would travel at slightly different speeds. I'm pretty sure that different wavelengths of light, when going through a medium, mm. travel. They either tra- they either travel at different speeds, but they oh. definitely diffract differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they won't come apart if you shoot them in a straight line. So they won't like one won't be slightly faster than the other if you shoot them in a straight line, and they don't diffract at all. So refraction is moving from one medium to an uh, to another sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, and that's why. So when you uh, put uh, when you shine sort of light into or a laser into a glass of water, it'll look like it's gone. It'll go sort of squint. Yeah. Yeah. So it's from one medium to another, but we're always in air unless we're in water. So that's not really an issue for us. For us, because it's not travel. It's it's always going to be yeah. traveling at, at the speed it would be in air. But if you get your gamma gun with a nice, helpful, visible light uh, guiding beam, yeah, um, and it travels through like a, a patch of air that is more uh, moist, then then those are going to come apart. Negligible. Is it negligible? Okay, fine. Negligible, probably, so our gamma yeah. gun with visible light guiding beam is 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 going to be okay as a I'm, concept. I am a fairly certain. Cool, I'll file a patent this afternoon. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> We're not making quite enough weapons of mass destruction over here at Sci Guys Pod, are we? I'm only going to sell them to the good guys, Corey. Yeah, like the Americans. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> right there, are they the good guys? Oh, I don't know. Sometimes. It's bang out who you are. The least worst guys, all right? <laughs> Again, sometimes. <laughs> so the IEA, the IE, the IAEA, got it. Yeah, my friends. Your friends, yeah. You should have, mm. you should have corrected me there. Look, you know this. Um, the IAEA is essentially uh, good, good radiation people. They're there to help everyone okay, with good. nuclear yeah. stuff. Yeah. But good nuclear stuff. They actually yeah. said, um, <laughs> they actually said specifically here, through its safeguards and verification activities, the IAEA oversees that materials capable of producing radiation are not diverted from peaceful uses. Wow. Yeah. The good guys. Good, yeah. yeah. We don't want real to hurt guys. people with this. We just want to help people. Make some tasty food. Low bar, mm-hmm. right? Very low bar. We don't want to hurt people. We're it not going to use good. this to hurt people. But that's <laughs> <it>. <laughs> so here's a quote from, uh, you know, as I said, uh, Dr. Pierre Lagoda, the head of plant breeding at the IAEA, or plant breeding and genetics. So 
He said, spontaneous mutations are the motor of evolution. We are mimicking nature in this. We are concentrating time and space for the breeder so he can do the job in his lifetime. We concentrate how often mutants appear, going through 10,000 to 1 million, just to select the right one. Um, so, essentially, with normal selective breeding, you need to wait for you need to wait for mutations to happen and that can happen over like sort of multiple generations you'll have like chance mutations essentially what you're doing is you're waiting for just the right change to happen mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. so i mean there's obviously going to be lots of mutations all plants are sort of like uh, or not necessarily just mutations but differences between the plants sort of variation um they're all going to be slightly different so you're going to have plants that are taller plants that are shorter what you want to do is just breed the ones that are sort of say taller together and again, yeah. again and again and again until you get taller and taller and taller and taller and taller plants yeah. um, or you know more resilient plants that ones that stand up to disease better all that sort of stuff so essentially with with normal selective breeding you need to wait for these sort of chance mutations that confer a benefit to the plant um, or as I said benefit to us who wants to eat the plant so this could be better color better uh, yield more resilient crop or a tastier crop or any number of things that we look for in the foods that we eat but if you think about how long it takes to do that as i've said you've got to wait for generations of these plants which for like you know we're harvesting like annually for a lot of things right mm. um and you know it could be quicker or it could be it could be short it could be sort of slower but it's it's something that is hard to do over your lifetime, right? Because you're making little incremental changes each time. Especially if the plants are particularly good at not mutating, which yeah. generally I think things are quite good at. So. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's their, that's their whole shtick, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and so if you were to go out and look for some wild fruit and veg, you'd probably have a hard time matching them to their modern counterparts. And they're, because they've changed so, so, so much. So, um, this, and that's all to do with sort of selective breeding. Like, so think of it like humans hijacking the natural selection process mm. to just make it do what we want. Yeah. So instead of the plants being in an environment, uh, sort of adapting to better suit their environment, we are we <laughs> we're basically making them adapt to better suit our needs. Right. Yeah. 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 That's what we've been doing for quite a while now. And we're very good at it. You know, we've been, as you said, we've been doing it for a long, long time, and it's it. It's very. You don't need to understand genetics or anything necessarily. To, or no, you don't need to understand sort of like actual genetics to do it. You need to understand that if you make two big things make a thing, the thing that they make will probably be big as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. But that's a fairly straight. You could do that observationally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just look at people. Yeah, just look at people exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so you know, it's been going on for so so long. That's why we've we've done it with not just with crops, but also with the sort of dog breeds and and all of these sort of things. But domesticated crops do not look the same as their wild counterparts. So what I've got here for you is just a few little pictures and I want oh. you to tell me what uh, what they are. What we would call this. What, what we would call it, yeah. Right, so this is okay. a wild version of a number of different sort of oh. crops. Wow, what a fun this game. This is exciting. I want, uh, you know, there's there's no there's no sort of time limit to this. Whoever gets it first doesn't matter. And by the way, we'll be playing this game over uh, on our Patreon. We'll do a bonus episode for our patrons where we just where we go through these and we do some more of them. Yeah. And, you know, if it's fun, we might even start doing this kind of thing on the yeah. on Sci Guys Live. Yeah. Oh, know? that would be sick. So here we go. What is okay, this first I one? Think I think I know this. a banana. Yeah, a banana. Yeah, a banana. Banana? It's yeah. a banana with massive seeds, and then we've bred it to have tiny little baby seeds. And to make it longer. Absolutely. Because yeah. that looks quite short. Yeah, you're, you're <gasps> spot on. Yeah, it's like yeah. the size of a pear. Yeah. So bear in mind that with fruits, uh, you know, um, and for the people listening at home, picture a very, very short banana. And if you open it up, imagine just cramming a banana full of apple seeds. This yeah. is what this is what it looks like. Like as many apple seeds as you can fit in there, almost as many apple seeds as there is actual banana. They almost look like popcorn kernels. Exactly. So, like, in terms of size and the look of them. And the reason for this is, obviously, that fruits are there for... I mean, the edible fruits that are meant to be eaten by mm. us. They're there for plants to spread their seeds. That's the yeah. purpose of them. Yeah. We know. Yeah. For they're for yummy for us. The yummy for us is the plants tricking us into doing their work. Oh, they're yeah. gaslighting us. I'm angry now. <laughs> Manipulate. I've been tricked they're, all my life. <laughs> plants are girl boss, okay? Yeah. We, we know this. <laughs> yes, um, this girl second boss. one... This is from a, uh, I think, uh, a painting from many, many, uh, many, many years that ago. That has got to be watermelon, surely. Yeah, so you're right. It is a watermelon. If you're um, listening at home instead of watching, uh, you know, it looks, I guess, kind of like a very, very big orange, but it's green on the outside and the segments are red. Yeah, and it's like 50% yeah. pulp. 50% pulp and 
massive, massive seats, just full of seats. It's all the right colours, but it's segmented off like little wedges, like exactly. an orange would be. Yeah, yeah. and so we've just weird. we've bred watermelons to have less and less of that sort of pithy, sort of uh, pulpy bit, yeah. and um, fewer seeds, and just smaller it, seeds. A smaller seeds. We open it up, and it's just like it's you know you know what a watermelon looks like on the inside. Yeah, and this is not even remotely the same. Just to quickly okay. take us onto a tangent, um, in one of the previous episodes, you sort of had uh, a frustrated rant about people saying it's basic science. Yeah. And I feel like this is a great example where you've grown up in a world where you know what a watermelon is, right? Mm -hmm. You know what a watermelon is, you know what a banana is. And if someone was to tell you that this thing here is a watermelon, you'd be like, I know what a watermelon is. It's basic science. This is what a watermelon is. And then you're shown this and realize that we have sort of selectively bred something and changed the way that nature naturally goes and or goes on its own and 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 now and now we've got this thing that that isn't that isn't really real mm. yeah <laughs> but you would but you would swear because it's mm. because it's the world to you watermelons are part of the world we think of them as being natural when yeah. they're anything yeah. but and this is why the, the concept of gmos and like it bothers me people being scared of gmos because Man, we've been emming O's for <laughs> as long as we've been eating O's. But we've you also know? got like or trauma from like, we've got such a cultural trauma with um, radiation and with like getting involved, like like humans getting involved in things and messing things around. Um, like the idea, like that's what I was saying about the plants, the idea of like using gamma radiation to increase the, the, um, the mutation rate of plants because of our sort of associations with gamma radiation even like i i i, I know that i would naturally go my instinct would be like oh that's going to make bad mutations and actually it's just going to increase oh, the number of mutations and some of them will be good some will be bad some will be neutral mm. but just the the idea of radiation instinctively tells me that those the the results of that will be bad ones there's the th thing is there's no bad mutation yes, sure there are just mutations we say things are bad but i mean we could say a bad mutation is one that um limits doesn't, health yeah. or relative but, to us it's bad yeah and i would still us. i would still instinctively go mm, radiation is going to make those plants relatively bad to us right and, and it's, so it's just yeah. rubbish it's i mean it makes sense yeah. to be cautious about, ra about around radiation yeah. but when it comes to the point of thinking any use of radiation is bad it it's just again it's this sort of anti-science view yeah yeah Let's yeah. move on to the last one. You're not getting this. Uh, you're not. Okay. I know you're not already because I didn't get it. Okay. Um, what are these? What are those? What you're looking at for everyone at home, uh, these are little sort of orangey yellow. Looks They look kind of like tomatoes. Um, they kind of look yeah. in a sort of like a, br a bristly They're growing on a branch is that a branch or a vine it looks sort of like a, a, a sort of a, bra a, a branchy vine kind of like um brambles yeah. like the grow like like what yeah. those grow on um but they look like sort of big apples or sort of yellowy tomatoes is it a pumpkin I was, no i was gonna i was gonna say apples to be honest but i feel like that's not the answer no no i i look i'll give you both one more guess think okay think of what absolutely this does not look like <laughs> A deer. Um, <laughs> I love growing think about my ideas. That abs or a vegetable that it absolutely does not look like. Um, um, get a right. carrot. N carrots are no. rich. No. Oh, no. Yeah, of course. Um, oh, you almost said it. I know that it was the one that was on your tongue. An avocado. No. Oh, so close. No, it's an eggplant. What? An aubergine. Yep. What? Yep, those are wild eggplants. Those what? aubergines don't know what aubergines look like. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get with the program. Exactly. Get and with so the emojis. <laughs> my point here, my point here for you is that all of these uh, are wild type, uh, wild types of the sort of, of of these common sort of fruits and vegetables, and they look so so different. Um, and it took a long, long time to to make all of those changes. Think about the number of mutations that would have to happen to get from like that yellowy tomato -y, tomato -y eggplant <laughs> to the eggplant that we know and tolerate today. You know, uh, it's, yeah. a, it's a lot. It's a lot it of changes. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. Like uh, maybe it's fine. So as I said, we'll do a longer version of this sort of fun little game over on the Patreon. But I just wanted to give you guys an idea of the differences that that are made between sort of wild versions of fruit and veg and sort of, um, you know, the ones that we have now. I mean, even wild strawberries are these tiny little things that are packed with seeds. They taste great, yeah, obviously. Yeah. But like... If you don't know that you're looking for strawberry, or like what wild strawberries look like, you're not necessarily going to find a wild strawberry, yeah. right? Because they they look kind of like strawberries, but they're just little and green and like. There's not much of the actual berry. Yeah, yeah. very little, very yeah. little. 
ding a ling ling it's the ad bell <laughs> what are we advertising today we're advertising our spicy merch uh, I am wearing the tardigrade beanie that we're selling. Uh, it's a little little tardigrade boy, little water bear going, ooh. And if you like the tardigrade beanie, you could also get our matching tardigrade t-shirt with a little smiling tardigrade that isn't going ooh, but is going ee. ee. And if you like the tardigrade t-shirt, you might also like the Psy Guys little pin badges we've made. Wow. They don't match, but they do say Psy Guys, and you can show your love for Psy Guys in your pin badge collection, and they're very cute. Yeah, it's the actual logo. And there's still a chance to grab our Psy Guys calendar, which will give you a discount on the future calendar if you get it now. And an extra mm. episode of Psy Guys, all about calendars. Yeah. Oh, Wow, yeah, the, they will the get calendar that. episode, yeah. Well, that's the spawn from ourselves. Back to the episode. So let's get on to the history of Atomic Gardens. We understand the principle of how they work. You're just irradiating plants to make them mutate. Now, bear in mind, I know someone's probably uh, been worn- wondering this or worried about this. The plants... Um, there's not like sort of any excess radiation. The, the plants aren't so irradiated that they then themselves become radioactive and dangerous to eat. There are just some genetic mutations that have been caused to the plants that have made changes to them, you know, and changes that they can then pass on, right? It's just, it, they're not radioactive plants, you know, they're not glowing green or, or, or you know, ready to kill any any child that eats, you know, eats mm, them. It might be, to be fair, if they if they evolve like a uh, poison. <laughs> I, <laughs> sure, yeah, I think... Although... Or they evolve like a, a, a phosphorescent gene. <laughs> probably wouldn't be breeding those ones. Yeah. Hey, hey, teeth. hey, should we, should we be breeding... Which apples do you want us to breed? Do you want us to do the poison death deadly <laughs> apples? Or these really lovely, crisp, tasty ones? But that does actually lead me onto a question I have, which Small was... Problem. What is the testing... What is the testing route for these things? Because obviously if you're creating mutations and lots of mutations, you... Is there a, is there a more stringent testing system for like whether this is a good strain i honestly look i i was looking at the sort of 50s um and stuff and I, it's hard to find solid information on it to be mm. perfectly honest right you know most of what comes up is based a few articles and some blogs talking about this thing that no one seems to remember um, and obviously we were doing it uh, we were still doing that sort of thing in 2007 but y- yeah i mean you know y- you there, there would be tests. There would be stringent tests, as there are stringent tests for yeah. any uh, sort of food stuff um, that, that we then give out to people. And this know? is happening. This is not happening in like a traditional agricultural setting. This is like they're trying to mutate things to get a good strain that they then might disseminate in the form of seeds. Is that correct? Yeah, presumably. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, I'm going to be honest, Luke. I can tell you how they did it in the fifties. Yeah. I only found out in the sort of uh, towards the end of my research uh, that they were still doing something similar in 2007. So I yeah. don't know how they would be doing it in that context. Wow. But um, in the 50s, <laughs> in the sort of 50s, it was it was very interesting. They would essentially just... Oh gosh, this is ridiculous. They would essentially have just a rod, <laughs> a rod of some radioactive material. I can't exactly remember oh what God. it was, uh, but they've got a rod of radioactive material and they just have it sat in the middle of a field <laughs> and they plant all of the plants they want to plant just in a circle around the rod. Yeah. Um, and if they ever want to come and visit the field, the rod lowers into a Ooh, lead box. Clever. Yeah, very wow. smart. Wow. Very Ooh, high tech. Let's not kill ourselves with radiation. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah. Hey, it's the 50s. They're yeah. doing all sorts of wacky stuff in the 50s, and then they found out it was bad. Yeah. 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 Racism. Yeah. That was a- yeah, well, <laughs> we're still doing that sometimes. We're, we're trying. <laughs> <laughs> Can't put that in a lead box. <laughs> <laughs> Can we irradiate that out of people? Yeah, I wonder. Hmm. I think that might be... Uh, it's genocide. You're, you're advocating for right. oh. Either genocide or... Um, what's that Hitler thing? Eugenics? Eugenics, yeah. I was going to say euthanasia. Still genocide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or the ones you don't <laughs> There's keep. There's a different type of... Gen- yeah. I feel like we're splitting hairs here. Like, <laughs> what, what flavor of genocide would you like today? Um, <laughs> well, I just mean you could do... You could do... Uh, like, do I want to get into this? You could do eugenics without <laughs> killing the people you don't want. You just don't let them breed and you breed the ones you still do genocide. want. Still genocide. Is it really? Still genocide. Yeah. Genocide of like a gene line. Yeah. 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 It's, it's still, eugenics is is almost inherently genocidal. I mean, look yeah. here. I mean, I think it's maybe a looser definition of genocide. Yeah. But it's genocide with a lowercase g. Jesus. Mm. <laughs> no, so genocide is the destruction of a people, um, like an ethnic, national, yeah. or religious group. So it is genocide. Right, because it's, it's, it's a, not the subsection that you desi- that you 
mark undesirable is genocided. Yeah, I mean, how eugenics is often done is... How did we manage to get from that? <laughs> yeah. How eugenics is often done is uh, through sterilization as well. Right. Um, you know, you can sterilize a bunch of people and they won't be able to then pass on their genes and yeah. so then you have, you have then wiped them out. That's why a lot of deaf people um, have take issues with sort of um, uh, genetically treating... Um, sort of the mutations that would cause deafness mm. because you're then sort of you're you're then removing deaf people from the, the sort of population or re- reducing the number of deaf people deaf people yeah. in, in future in the population and this doesn't just go for deaf people this goes for um many many different um groups of disabled people mm. um but then again that's not to say that every single member of those groups thinks that no group is a monolith and there are i was going to say good people on both sides which is True. Um, <laughs> that's just not what I was trying to Variation. say. Variation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. it. Uh, there's, 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 there's different opinions on, on this on either side. You know, um, that's not a conversation for today, though. No. So let's get back to the atomic <laughs> gardens, shall we? So they would put uh, a, a rod of radioactive material in the middle of the garden. Um, in the middle of the garden, in the middle, of sort of a field. The the plants would be planted uh, around it in a circle. Um, they could lower the rod when they want to come to the field. Uh, now, I have a question for you. What do you think happened to the plants that were the closest to the rod? Did they die? Oh, they, they just died. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I mean, I mean, that makes sense. I, I don't know if I would do it any other way. It's the most... It, it is the most logical way to do the thing that they were trying to do. Mm. It still seems ridiculous that they were just growing, like, just growing big circles mm. of crops yeah. around a, a, a bloody rod that's a just shooting stick. out... radioactive stick. Exactly! Yeah. yeah. Just a radioactive stick! Yeah. Oh, yeah, we got this... Yeah, we got this rock... And it shoots out it shoots out death lasers, it shoots out death death beams, um, hmm. and, and so we're gonna put it next to our food to yeah. see if it makes our food better. See what happens. <laughs> that is why this would sound dangerous if you don't understand it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this is what. Okay, and so we're still doing it to this day. No, I think I mentioned this elsewhere, but it's interesting that people talk about crystals um, uh, giving off sort of energy mm. because we do have rocks that, that give off energy. It's just you, you don't. Mm. You don't want to touch them. They just don't want to describe it as radiation. Yeah, it's I mean, more, if, more magic. If you it? want, if you want to, okay. So if you want to curse someone <laughs> yeah. with a crystal, you know, by giving them a crystal, give them just give so, them uranium. Yeah, uranium. I thought crystals absorbed energy. They, they can give they off and absorb. Right. Okay, interesting. Yeah, cool. I mean, if we're talking about energy crystals, Luke. I mean, yeah. If I'm talking about rocks with energy, yeah, I'm talking about some. I'm mm. talking about some bloody uranium. Yeah, you know. Mm. Obviously not pure uranium. It's like uranium in a thing because then it would be a rock. Whatever. Mm. Doesn't really matter. <laughs> the point is that. <laughs> How these atomic gardens worked is that they built, they they, they basically built uh, sort of um, these, uh, they, they built this whole contraption to avoid irradiation themselves and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and I kind of want to tell you about the Atomic Gardening Society. Now, I don't trust the source on this one because I think I found it on a blog or a news site which was quoting a blog. It doesn't really matter wow. hugely because it's yeah. not fully... Re- it's, look, it's not scientific information. It's not right. fully relevant to the episode. It's just a fun anecdote, and I thought I would share it with you. Great. It's about the sort of formation of the Atomic Gardening Societies. In March 1959, an unusual group of scientists, government officials, and lesser worthies assembled for a dinner party in the dining hall of the Royal Commonwealth Society in London. Unbeknownst to them, one of the courses was a strange strain of American peanuts, NC4X, North Carolina 4th Generation x ray peanuts produced from seeds that had been exposed to 18,500 Rundgen units of x-rays in order to induce mutations. The irradiated peanuts were unusually large as big as almonds, according to those in attendance, mm. outshowing the British ground nuts served alongside and had reached the dining table through the generosity of their inventor, Walter C. Gregory of North Carolina State College, who sent them as a gift to Mrs. Muriel Haworth, Eastbourne, enthusiast for all things atomic. Essentially, she was just really bummed out at how people responded to her very cool peanuts. Um, like, you know, they were, they, they, were, they were like, oh, what, this is, I don't care about this. And uh, she was obviously like an atom head. That's what in the business, look, you know this. That's what we call people that are like, you know, obsessed with radiation. Mm. I've been heads. called that myself many times. Oh, yeah. yeah. Looks, looks the biggest damn head I know. all the time. <laughs> in fact, I'd like you to explicitly refer head. to me as that. Okay, <laughs> I'm joined yeah, by head. my co-hosts, Jamp and Atom Head. <laughs> Hello. It is I, Atom Head. It's like a knockoff superhero. <laughs> 
<laughs> the tiniest possible head. <laughs> yeah. Just a body with it's a tiny single head. atom it's resting just, on top. It looks like a headless body, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she was like really bummed out about that. And so she was looking at them, um, at the sort of nuts, the uncooked ones, being like, what am I going to do with all of these? Um, and then she just decided to put it in the ground to see how it grew. And it it was... It, it germinated in four days and then was two feet high really, really quickly. Um, and so she called the newspapers and then there was this all, it was a sort of frenzy. It was like um, all of this sort of stuff. She formed the Atomic Gardening Society. She was president, of course. <laughs> and then um, sort of, uh, then she so made a her own podcast so you can be the host. <laughs> hey. hey. Someone should do that. If people will not listen to me, <laughs> I will make them listen to me. You're okay? all hostages here. Oh, you guys are the hostages. Oh, okay. you can't leave. <laughs> oh, yeah, we are, but True. also they are. You wouldn't talk to me, so I had to do this. Yeah, okay. Well. Um, so <laughs> she <laughs> she then made like a sort of how-to uh, book as well, a how-to guide. Um, and so she basically set up the Atomic Gardening Society. So like my point here is that this, is, this wasn't just some ooh, tiny little fringe thing. This mm. seemed to be... There was a there was a fair few people doing this, and you know, obviously, it was it, it was um, actually used to produce a bunch of things. I mean, I will run through a list here of the plants that were modified using Atomic Garden. So you've got red grapefruit, disease resistant cocoa, premium barley, which is used for um, Scotch whiskey um, and beer. Um, also, rice, wheat, which is used for bread and pasta, barley, as I've said already, uh, pears, peas, cotton, peppermint, um, which is kind of reduced, uh, uh, sort of um, resistant to wilting. Sunflowers, peanuts, sesame, bananas. They were just irradiating so wow. many plants. And what's crazy uh, about this to me is that I had never heard of this, and yet this has clearly affected my life because yeah. they, they've they, they actually did it to, to make new strains of plants. You just get those seeds to to plant them again. And do yeah. any of these strains still exist today? As far as I'm aware, they do. Wow. I don't have any specific... I don't have specific knowledge on which specific strains, but I, I, as far as I'm aware, they do still exist today. But it's it's just absolutely mad that we were just shooting radiation at stuff, essentially, in such an uncontrolled way as well. Like, <laughs> just... Let's just plant it in a field and put a big rod in the middle. Bonk. <laughs> like, that... I love the 50s. <laughs> I love the 50s. Like, that's what science was. It's like, just do the thing. Oh, should we do it? In a, nah, nah. Nah, it's all ethics committees nah, and nah, nah, funding nah, nah, meetings. Nah, 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 nah. Gosh, no. I want to exploit people and I'm not going to let anyone stand in my way. And if I find something out about, like, you know, about the world at the end, that's fine. It sound like the Nazis. My point is that, you know, back then, I, I mean, okay, I was making a, a little joke about how they would just, you know, absolutely exploit anyone. And there were very few sort of safeguards, which I'm very, very happy that we have safeguards now. And obviously the science is, is better today because it's more, it's more controlled and whatnot. Um, and sure, they probably did lab tests before they went out and just chucked it in a field. But, like, I do love that sort of boldness of just, yeah, we're just going to have a stick of, a radioactive stick in the middle of our field. <laughs> and also, all the plants close to it are going to die. Yeah. Like, I mean, how, like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, if we were doing this now, we'd probably try and figure out, oh, how far away should we put them, you know, <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But they're just like, ah, yeah, right there. <laughs> there. It's all part of the process, baby. Exactly. And this wasn't the sort of first time that this had sort of come about, obviously. Um, you know, I just want to point out that in the 20s, um, they had experiments with uh, plants uh, and x-rays. So mm -hmm. in the 20s, they'd shown that you could um, make heritable, sort of inheritable changes um, in barley, as, as I said, using x-rays. Um, and then... The, the, the term atomic garden was first used in the 50s um, and that was to reference experiments um, in uh, in Chicago in which plants were basically put in an atmosphere made of their radioactive carbon. I don't know which, um, I, I, I presumably carbon uh, 14, but um, yeah, I, you know, I mean, it's it's very, very cool. Mm. Very, very cool. This This whole thing, this whole movement. So why did we stop this? That's what I'd like to know, because if it's if we're going up until 2007, so have we replaced it with something better? Oh my, can you read my mind? Yes. So, I I was about to say, but what do we do now? Mm. Come on, you want to take a get jump? Do we just carry on with the ones we've grown already? Kind of. Do we directly modify the DNA? 
Bingo. Genetic modification, baby. Oh, of course. Yeah, why? Okay, so I saw someone talk about this as like, uh, you know, atomic gardening is bringing a sledgehammer and just shattering a piece of rock. <laughs> and, you know, it's going to send shards everywhere. But maybe you get something good out of it, right? Oh. Okay, let's say you're trying to make a sculpture, yeah. right? You know, you're using a sledgehammer. Yeah, and to like, begin with, yeah. Yeah. Before yeah. you move on to the chisel for the little bits. Yeah, yeah. no, no. This is all sledgehammer. Oh, this is all this sledgehammer. Is because you've not invented the chisel yet. Yeah. But yeah. in yeah. 2007, no, no we invented the chisel. <laughs> there's no chisel. <laughs> not into, you know, so um, we, were, we, were doing, I th- we were doing sort of, I think, genetic modification in 2007. Were we? I was a child then, so it's hard for me to remember. Um, but mm, I feel like we... No, 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 no. <laughs> we must have been. No. no, GMOs were around in 2007, I'm sure. But I thought GMOs were kind of like... It's almost like a catch-all for like just anything where we've selectively bred stuff. Yeah, but I feel like... No, no, no. Cause no, 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 no. Sorry, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was agreeing with the first part of what you said. And then not the second part. So it's not just where we selectively bred stuff. That's okay. not a GMO. Should be, technically. Because it's kind of the not. same thing. It, it, okay, so, I mean, it, it is and it isn't, right? Um, so a genetically modified organism, um, it, it, it refers to genetic engineering techniques. So I think the first one was in the 70s or something. But um, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of like where, what kind of scale were we doing it on? We would have been doing it by 2007. GMOs, yeah, GMOs were around by 2007. Yes. So um, a GMO, genetically modified organism, um, that's specifically genetic engineering. So selective breeding, all that stuff, it doesn't really fall on, in, under it because while we are influencing the genes, we're doing so naturally. Sure, yeah. For everyone listening, I'm using quotes, naturally. Mm. Y- yeah, like it... it it's it's not as direct, yeah. you know. Hmm. So to use that sort of analogy again, you know, if you're doing atomic gardening, you're bringing a sledgehammer and you're smashing to smashing things up. Uh, whereas with a genetic sort of um, modification, you're going in with a very fine chisel and just and just extricating every single thing hmm. that you need. For another ex- another example, let's say you've got a splinter, right? Now. <laughs> get, a, got, get a mallet and smash your finger you off. Well, you've got a, yeah. well, if you've got a splinter, right? Now you're saying to, you've come to me and you said, "Corey, I have a splinter. I'd like you to remove my splinter." And I say, "Well, no worries. Look, here are my pinking shears, and I will just snap off the end of that finger. No more finger." And you're like, "Well, I suppose you did remove the the splinter, so I can't complain." However, <laughs> genetic modification, um, GMOs, it's me just taking some tweezers and pulling out the splinter. Mm. It's 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 the difference between sort of. Um, roundabout trying to deal with the problem using sort of what is uh, using the sort of uh, i guess the inbuilt mechanisms within the organism and then going in yourself and just messing with it using again inbuilt mechanisms and organisms but reworking them in a different way Mm. and that's what i love about this that's why like this that's why i put natural in quotes because the difference between sort of selectively breeding and genetic modification in my mind they're difference in methods. They're not difference in kind. Like marking one of them as natural and the other as unnatural to me just seems so odd because yeah. all of this stuff, like near enough, all of this stuff exists in nature anyway. Like literally, the exact thing we use for genetic modification comes from something in like well, I mean, say something natural, but it comes from another organism. Do you know what I mean? Like that's that's what we do. You know, we're just we're just using we're hacking life to do what we want and we've been doing it for as long as we've had agriculture and that's incredible. We've got cats that are sort of catching a pest for us. We've got dogs doing any number of jobs. Like the sheer number of breeds of dog to do so many different things is insane. We've got all of these plants and foods that are just amazing and perfect. Imagine having to forage for tiny little crappy berries. Now I can just walk to a shop and get a massive strawberry the size of like, you know, a baby's fist and eat it. (laughs) And I can do that because we've just, we've just bred things. We've just made nature what we need it to be. I think that's so cool. And it's baffling to me that people will say, ah, it's fine when we make nature what we want in this way. But if we do it this better way, that is more precise, as I don't like it. Well, it's dangerous they and bad. They don't understand it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And obviously there's worries and concerns with genetic modification because of implications, all, all of that sort of stuff. But like, probably a bit better than just irradiating a bunch of plants and seeing what happens, you know? Yeah, yeah but there was always that risk. Like if you genetically, selectively bred something to be really tall... You might also, at the same time, accidentally introduce something that gives you cancer 20 years down the line. It's unlikely, but 
it, you might have done it. Like yeah. if the if the plant that you bred had a mutation in it that made it really tall, but also gave you cancer, you would have you would have selectively bred that thing because it's tall and not realized it gave you cancer. To bring yeah. it back to eugenics for just a second. <laughs> oh dear. Oh yeah. Go on. Go on. <laughs> Sometimes when I say things, I realize, wow, I'm going to clip that and post it on Twitter. <laughs> so guys out of context. Uh, so to bring it back to eugenics for a second, that is one of the main reasons that eugenics doesn't work um, and why it is pseudoscience. Obviously, mm. you know, morally speaking, it's, eugenics is out the window, right? Nah, uh, we're, we're done with that, right? But like, let's, let's park the moral argument for just a second uh, because... A moral argument is not necessarily the strongest one because some people have different morals to you. Yeah, eugenics just—we've discussed this in our eugenics episode. I'm sure it doesn't work when you when you when you decrease that sort of um, variety in uh, in sort of in, in sort of diversity of uh, gene pools or whatever. You are going to have decreased fitness, right? Like you're going to have it in some way. Like the the plants that we <laughs> the plants that we have now are very very good at doing what we want them to do. We are looking after them though you know we, we're giving yeah. them pesticides and all of yeah. this sort of stuff but i'm sure that like there are plenty of problems with all of these sort of crops and even when we're being more resilient uh, making more resilient ones and whatnot you know like if you try and selectively breed for a certain trait you're gonna have other things like sort of like come about like so let's say we want to breed an like sort of air an Aryan race you know just blonde hair blue eyes sort of thing it's not going to be too long until we're starting to see like some some problems if we're like trying to cut out any sort of uh, genetic uh, sort of defect that we don't want, you know, because the smaller and smaller gene pool gets, the more amplified all of these like other little mutations and problems become. Um, and it's also a reason why you should probably avoid incest babies. Yeah. Mm. Don't want to do that. Yeah. Don't want to do they that. They don't turn out very well. Quit that. So that is it for Atomic Gardens. You know, we've been through the whole the whole sort of thing. We've gone through radiation. We've gone mm. through genetic mutations. And then how they use that for Atomic Gardens and where we are now mm. with genetic modification. And the only thing left to do is a quick fire quiz. Atomic Garden Edition. So the rules for the quick fire quiz are the same as always. I will ask one question. That's one question between the two of you. The first person to buzz in with the correct answer after I finished asking the question wins. What do they win, Jam? Some uh, a radiation in the garden. Yum. No, I don't eat. We lit at the win. start of this. We literally <laughs> said. I, I spent so long talking about not eating radioactive materials. I would like a tan. But it's from the garden. It's natural. It's no. natural. Oh, yeah. Gosh, we just talked about how it's not bad. Luke, what's your buzzer? <sighs> Jamp, what's your buzzer? Oh. Okay, that reads more radiation to me. What is yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an atom the spitting out and spitting out a beta radiation particle. <laughs> ah, okay. okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> Little electron oh, There's some alpha particles in my food. The question for you is: Can you name at least one of the plants that I listed? Oh, sorry, I thought you finished. That were modified using atomic gardens. Champ. Uh, oh, uh, um, oh, strawberries. I don't know. Strawberries on there. <laughs> that is not one of the ones <laughs> I mentioned. <laughs> I just pulled that out of my ass. Luke. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Oh my goodness me! Um, oh dear! I'll give you a clue. It was literally like pick another berry. Ago. Pick another berry. But it doesn't have berry in the name, and it doesn't look like a berry. Wom, wom, Jam. Wom. Banana. Correct. Oh, oh yeah. yeah very I was good, thinking of yeah. a different section of the my podcast. My old favorite fruit. Well, yeah, that is. So was I actually. That's why I said strawberry. Well, that is it for this week. Before we go, we'd like to thank all of our patrons with a very special thank you to exec producers Rosa Rodriguez and Donito, and thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday, and why not leave us a nice wee comment? You can support the pod at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys, or you can find and contact us at SciGuys Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and here on YouTube, and at SciGuys on TikTok too. Or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod at gmail.com. You can follow me at not Cory everywhere. You can follow me at Jamkin everywhere. You, you can, can follow him at Atomhead everywhere. <laughs> All right. Now we, have to, now we have to go and get Atomhead on Twitter <laughs> just in case someone nicks it. Someone's probably already got it, to be fair. Uh,